Open and proactive communication. Now, I, just, I, I touched on briefly just you know, responding the right way. I just want to show you a couple of verses to do with that. So Proverbs 15.1. And these are, I guess, would be probably familiar verses to you. But Proverbs 15 says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright. But the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. So what is this verse saying here? It's saying that if you speak softly, if you speak gently, it will turn away wrath. So if your spouse or your wife is angry and you respond angrily, that's not the right way to respond. You need to respond with, with a soft answer and that will turn away the wrath. It says, but grievous words stir up anger. So that's the opposite of a gentle response, right? Is grievous words. What does it mean to be grievous? It's words that grieve you, that sadden you, that offend you. Um, so don't use uh, grievous words. It'll just stir up even more anger. Look at this. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. So a wise tongue has knowledge, but it uses it aright. So there's a right way to speak knowledge and there's a wrong way to speak knowledge. The wise mouth speaks knowledge but speaks it in the right way. Look, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. So you see the, the mouth of the fool has no control, has no um, discretion, right? It just pours out everything. It has knowledge but it has no discretion on how to use that knowledge. That's the opposite there of using words wisely. And I touched on this when I talked about, you know, if, if you have this open communication, how you respond is very important. Because if your husband or your wife comes to you with a concern, comes to you with a worry, comes to you with a struggle, and you respond the wrong way, you're going to shut down communication. So don't belittle their opinions. You know, don't call them stupid. You know, try to understand their point of view. The Bible says here in Proverbs 13.10, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. So be humble in your relationship, because if you're not, pride is the source. It says here, only by pride cometh contention. So whenever there's contention in a relationship, somebody's being proud. Either both of you are being proud, or one of you is being proud, and that's why there's contention. If one of you is willing to be humble, you can pacify that contention. And ideally, both of you are humble. Um, so pride, pride I've got here is the enemy of relationship building and it's the cause of all contention. And, and just on a note here, I don't, I don't know if this really has anything to do with it, but I've got it under this point. You know, no-go zones are, are um, no-go zones destroy communication. And, and you experience that in churches, right? I mean, we talk, this is why I try and cultivate an open um, communication environment in this church because when you have no go zones in a church it just destroys the fellowship doesn't it if there are certain things that you can't talk about especially things to do with the bible i mean how are people going to now talk about other things because now they don't know whether the next doctrine they're going to bring up is touchy and this doctrine is touchy or this doctrine is touchy because any doctrine can be controversial right any issue any truth can be divisive so if this truth is going to be divisive, well, why can't this truth be divisive? And this truth, so then nobody wants to talk about anything. And then it's just all love, 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 Jesus loves you. And nobody's talking about you know, other things in the Bible that are equally important. So that principle, I believe, is the same in a marriage, same in a relationship. If there are things, you know, you need to humble yourself. If there are things that you don't want to talk about, that needs to change. You need to be willing to talk about that. Because if there are things that you talk about, with your husband or your wife and it's like no we're not going there that's a no-go zone we don't talk about that in our relationship that's going to destroy the fellowship in your marriage so don't have no-go zones and if you have no-go zones that needs to change you need to make those go zones and you know even if it's just with your husband or your wife you know i think it's a very bad idea to have no-go zones <clears throat> James 1.19, this is a very famous verse. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So, you know, they always say, you know, have, you have two ears and you have one mouth, right? So you should be listening two times as much as you speak. 
And, and that's true. You know, it says, it says, let every man be swift to hear. So hear first. Hear quickly. Understand. And be slow to speak. Think about what you're going to say before you say it. And be slow to write. If you feel yourself getting angry, then take a moment and calm down and speak a bit later. Don't get emotional too quickly because, again, that's going to hinder your communication in your relationship. You know, bad communication in a relationship leads to assumptions, doesn't it? Because when you're not talking, you're assuming things. You're assuming you know what they think. You're assuming you know what they like. You're assuming that that's bugging them or maybe they're just tired. Maybe it's not bugging them. So when you don't have a good communication, you're going to assume more. And when you assume more, there's going to be more problems. Because, you know, you know what they say about assume? How do you spell assume? You make an ass out of you and me, right? So that's why you don't assume, don't make assumptions. But if you have bad communication, you're going to assume more. That's why you need to talk. Need to talk. Let me let me share with you this um, this chapter in Joshua 22. Um, and maybe we'll just read the whole thing quickly. It says here in chapter 22. Then Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh. So just think about what, what has happened so far in Joshua. So remember Joshua was the, the, the book about them going into the promised land, right? And conquering all the, 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 tri the, the nations in the, the promised land. And now they've pretty much conquered most of it, right? And the tribe of the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, remember they wanted the, the promised, they wanted the land on the other side of Jordan before they went in. They said, hey, look, this is a land that's good for our children, good for our cattle. And then remember Moses said, you know, uh, you know, you got to, oh, it wasn't Joshua, I'm, I'm losing track now, but remember he said, you know, are, you, is, are your brethren going to go to war and you stay here? And they say, no, 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 we'll go in and fight the wars with our brethren, but we'll inherit the land on this side of Jordan. So they've fought all these wars now, they've, they've done all this fighting, and now they're going to go back to the land that, um, that Moses had promised them on the other side. Um, it says, And said unto them, You've kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. So that was the command to go in and fight with their brethren. And have obeyed my voice in all that I have commanded you. So they've, command, they've obeyed Joshua as well. You have not left your brethren these many days unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of, your, of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God hath given rest unto your brethren, as he promised them. Therefore now return ye, and get you unto your tents, and unto the land of your possession, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you on the other side Jordan. But take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law, law which Moses the, the servant of the Lord charged you, to love the Lord your God, and to walk in all his ways, and to keep his commandments, and to cleave unto him, and to serve him with all your heart, and with all your soul. So Joshua is sending them back and he's giving them a charge to continue to keep the commandments of the Lord and walk in the ways of the Lord. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away and they went unto their tents. Now to the one half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given possession in Bashan, but other, unto the other half thereof gave Joshua among their brethren on this side, Jordan, westward. And when Joshua sent them away also unto their tents, then he blessed them. Now let's just skip uh, through this for sake of time. Okay, and the children of Reuben, children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel out of Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go into the country of Gilead, to the land of their possession, whereof they were possessed, according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. And when they came unto the borders of Jordan, that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see to. And the children of Israel heard say, Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar over against the land of Canaan in the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. So what has happened? So they've gone over, they've crossed back over the Jordan River, and then the Reubenites, the Manassites, um, and, the half, uh, the, and the Gadites build an altar there, right? And then Israel hears about it. <clears throat> Verse 12, And when the children of Israel heard it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up to war against them. So why are they angry at this? Right? Because when God said, hey, you're going to you know, sacrifice things and you're going to worship me, he, he appointed certain places where they were to do that. And, and right now the tabernacle is in Shiloh on the other side of the Jordan River. And the children of Israel sent unto the children of Reuben and to the children of Gad and to the half-tribe of Manasseh and to the land of Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, and with him ten princes of each chief house, a prince throughout all the tribe of, tribes of Israel. 
and each one was in head of the house of their fathers among the thousands of Israel. And they came unto the children of Reuben, and to the children of Gad, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, unto the land of Gilead. And they spake with them, saying, Thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, What trespass is this that ye have committed against the God of Israel, to turn away this day from following the Lord, in that ye have builded you an altar, that ye might rebel this day against the Lord? Is the iniquity of Peor too little for us, from which we are not cleansed until this day? although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord, but that you must turn away this day from following the Lord, and it will be, seeing you rebel today against the Lord, that tomorrow he will be wroth with the whole congregation of Israel. So just notice these accusations flying across to Reuben, the, the tribe of Reuben, Gad, and um, the Manassites. Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed thing, and wrath fell on all the congregation of Israel, and that man perished not alone in his iniquity. Now look, here's the response. Then the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered and said unto the heads of the thousands of Israel, The Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knoweth, and Israel he shall know. If it be rebellion or if in transgression against the Lord, save us not this day. That we have built unto that we have built us an altar to turn from following the Lord, or if to offer thereon burnt offering or meat offering, or if to offer peace offerings thereon, let the Lord himself require it. And look at this. And if we have not rather done it for fear of this thing, saying in time to come, your children might speak unto our children, saying, what have ye to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord hath made Jordan, the Jordan River, a border between us and you, ye children of Reuben and children of Gad. Ye have no part in the Lord. So shall your children make our children cease from fearing the Lord. Therefore we said, let us now prepare to build us an altar, not for burnt offering nor for sacrifice, but that, may, that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings, that your children may not say to our children in time to come, you have no part in the Lord. Therefore said we that it shall be, when they shall so say to us or to our generation in time to come that we may say again, Behold the pattern of the altar of the Lord which our fathers made, not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between us and you. God forbid that we should rebel against the Lord and turn this day from following the Lord to, burn, to build an altar for burnt offerings, for meat offerings and for sacrifices besides the altar of the Lord our God that is before this tabernacle. And when Phineas the priests and the princes of the congregation and the heads of the thousands of, Israel's, uh, th thousands of Israel which were with him heard the words that the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the children of Manasseh spake, it pleased them. And Phineas the son of Eleazar the priest said unto the children of Reuben and to the children of Gad and to the children of Manasseh, This day we perceive that the Lord is among us because ye have not committed this trespass against the Lord. Now ye have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord. And basically they go back and, and their wrath was a peace. Now I just think this story is an interesting story to illustrate what I've been talking about communication. Because remember what happened. So they, they went back over the Jordan River and they built an altar. Right? And what did all the, the, the tribes on the other side of Jordan do? They didn't think about why are they doing this? What's the reasoning behind? You know, they didn't try and be compassionate and try and ask why they did this thing they just assumed it was for idolatry and they just had these assumptions because there was no communication there right so they just, they come to them and they're like you know why are you rebelling against god all these accusations and lumping them with with all, with all these other people that have committed terrible things you know oh what about the sin of peor remember the sin of Achan? you're just doing the same but this is what it's like in a relationship right if you're just assuming things and you don't have communication you assume things and then you start shooting accusations and you come across angrily. You know, you don't just go talk to that person. What did they do? They got, went and got all the other tribes, right? And got people on their side. And then they're going to go and attack, you know, the Reubenites and the Gadites and, and the half-tribe of the Manassites. But what would have been the right thing to do? Somebody to find out first, why are they building that altar? Why have you done this? And then they would have realized, hey, they're not building this to burn offerings on. They're not building this to offer sacrifices on. And they explain in that passage, hey, we built it because the Jordan River is between us. One day your children might say to our children, 
hey, you know, you're on that side of the Jordan River. You don't have anything to do with us. You can't come and offer sacrifices and, and offerings at, at the tabernacle in Shiloh. So they built it to say, hey, if this time comes, if your children do that to our children, we've instructed our children, we built this altar not for burnt offerings, not to sacrifice things on, but to remind them this is the pattern of what God commanded us to do, but the nation of Israel has cut us off because we're on the other side of the Jordan River. So it's an interesting story there that you can see what happens when there's a, there's a lack of communication. You've got assumptions, you've got accusations, you've got anger, but what happens when they actually talk and actually hear the other side? That wrath is appeased. And they even say, hey, you know, the God, the God, you know, God is among us. He's justified us this day. And the thing is, you know, they even say, you know, God knows the truth, don't they? God shall require. God knows why we've done this. And he does know. You know, he understands you. You know, you don't need to justify yourself before God and say, well, I'm just telling my husband because he just needs to know why I've done this. You know, you don't need to feel that way because God does understand you. He knows where you're coming from. But that's not the problem. The problem is maybe you're not coming across the right way. Maybe you're not communicating yourself the right way. Maybe this is bottled up anger because of a lot. It's revealing to you that you don't have good communication with, with your spouse. And that's what you need to learn from it. It's not an exercise in justifying yourself, you know, because God does understand where you're coming from. But you need to, what you need to focus on is making sure your spouse understands where you're coming from, but in a way that doesn't you know, use grievous words like we saw in Proverbs and stir up even more wrath, stir up even more anger. <clears throat> so I thought that was an interesting story. So bad, bad communications lead to assumptions. Um, and this is why we talked about pride. You know, only by pride cometh contention. So you need to humble yourself. And I think... One way we can apply this principle is if you're humbling yourself, you'll be the first to open up. And I always tell this to guys, right? I always tell this to guys that are going after girls. And I've, I've told this to your guy as well. <laughs> but I always tell this to guys. I say to them, you know, if you're pursuing a girl, you open up first. You know, because you should be leading the relationship. You should be taking charge and setting that precedent in your relationship that you're leading her, you're leading her spiritually, leading her in conversation. So you need to open up first. You know, you need to share things that are personal and intimate to you. Share your goals. Share things that you, you know, you want to, um, you know, uh, um, uh, have in your marriage and things like that. And the more you open up, the more the other person's going to open up. If you let down your guard first, that will encourage the other person to let their guard down. So it's the same in a marriage. If you want to have open and proactive communication, you need to, to do it first. You know, it's not like, hey, we want to have open and reactive communication. You know, you need to open up first. Remember we talked about having this attitude of service. You know, you need to think about what you can do differently. If you want a more open relationship, let down that guard first. And when you let it down, that'll help the other person to let it down. And you know, that is one reason why I think men should let, let, their, let their guard down first and lead in that sense. Because, you know, women are more emotional. Right? Women are more led by their heart. They're more easily heartbroken. So I think when you're dating, you know, I think it's, it's, it's right for a woman to guard her heart. You know, I don't, I don't, this is why I don't think a woman should just let everything out because when, when that relationship fails, you're going to probably be hurt, more hurt than the guy is. You know, so I think it's up to the guy to you know, open up, make the girl feel comfortable, make the girl feel confident. You know? And I think women, you need to be really careful. You know, guard your heart and, um, you know, because I'm talking about married couples here, right? Because dating is a bit different. I think, I think women should, should protect themselves and then once you're married, you can open up a bit more and things like that. Or as you, as you get to know one another, or that commitment um, goes a bit further, then um, you may want to open up then because then you'll be less prone to heartbreak. <coughs> so humility... Um, opening up is, I think, the best way to break down those barriers if you are first to do it. And the last point I just have on this open and proactive communication is to have an attitude of service, like I talked about, right? You know, having an attitude of service, what do I mean by that? It means focus on what you can do differently and not what the other person needs to do differently to make it work. Because yes, you can, you can go on and on about what the other person should be doing, but do you have any control over that? No. 
So focus on what you can do differently and what you can control. But also having the service attitude of service, meaning that communication isn't always about you. You know, communication isn't about making sure that your desires are, you know, whilst I say, yes, share your desires, that's not the main focus. It's not, the focal point is not you. It's not, hey, making sure that my wife knows what I want so that he can serve me and making sure that, like, he knows how I feel so that he knows how to treat me. Communication is about service. It's about so that you can love your spouse better. You can, you can treat your spouse better, right? That's what I mean by having an attitude of service. So it doesn't always have to be about you. You know, understand and enjoy what excites them. You know, what, what gets them up in the morning and, 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 and serve them in that way. Uh, you know, if they're, if they're on some certain bandwagon, you know, the latest bandwagon that they're excited about, get on it with them, right? Like, try and get excited about the things they get excited about, and then you'll have a better, better marriage, right? Because you'll both be excited about the same thing. So if they're excited about something, try and get excited about it also, so that you, um, you, know, you, you will serve them in that sense. And, you know, it's especially true in my marriage, because my wife knows me, right? Like, I, I go from one bandwagon to the next. Like, you know, one thing, you know, I'm, like, I'm on this thing, and then that's all I'm thinking about for, like, weeks and weeks and weeks on end, and then I move to something else, and then that's all I'm thinking about for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. So I'm especially like that. I go through phases, and I'm sure my wife is constantly jumping on different bandwagons. Um... All right, so open and proactive communication. So I hope I've given you some tips there to, to things that you can apply. And maybe when you go back and listen to this sermon, you can listen over them again and, and, and hopefully apply that in your life. 